Hello everyone, welcome to another virtual National Quilting Day lecture. In a moment, we will have Sarah Walcott, Collections Manager at the International Quilt Museum with us. I'm Laura Chapman. I would like to thank our National Quilting Day sponsors, the Lincoln Quilters Guild, Lincoln Modern Quilt Guild, Nebraska State Quilt Guild, AccuQuilt, Orifil, Handy Quilter, Bernina Sewing Center, Cosmic Cow, Sew Creative, and the International Quilt Museum. Now to introduce our next speaker. Sarah Walcott is the International Quilt Museum's Collections Manager. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in English and a Master of Arts in Textile History with a concentration in quilt studies from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Before joining the team full-time, she interned here at the museum in collections, exhibitions, and education. As Collections Manager, her responsibilities include accessioning and deaccessioning objects, preparing objects for photography, preparing and receiving shipments, processing loan agreements and contracts, maintaining our databases, and other functions to preserve our collection. Sarah also curated Hand and Mind in 19th Century Quilt Making. With that, welcome Sarah. Thank you. Hello. And happy National Quilting Day. So today we're going to go over caring for your quilts at home with everybody stuck in their houses for a little bit of extended time right now, we thought it might be a really good time to go over some of those projects you might be getting to after putting them off for a while. So we're going to go through um, a guide to cleaning your quilts and storing your quilts and some other considerations you just wanna keep in mind um, when you are caring for your textiles, historic and otherwise, at home. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is cleaning, which can definitely be a bit controversial. Um, my aim here is just to tell you what the very best practices are and the practices we follow at the International Quilt Museum. And then you should feel free to modify those as you see fit for your situation. These are just the best practices and you can go from there. So there are, there's no truly safe method of cleaning a quilt. Um, there are definitely unsafe methods and there are safer methods. So um, washing machines, definitely out. Um, on, in the photograph here, you see um, me and another student in the graduate program uh, vacuuming a quilt. Um, so you can see we use plastic screens over the surface of the quilt and we use museum grade variable speed vacuums on their lowest setting to vacuum. Um, the goal of vacuuming is not necessarily to thoroughly clean the quilt, it's really to pull the dust out because it has sharp edges on a microscopic level and those screens are in place to keep from pulling up any fibers from the quilt. We only wanna pull out the dust. So the first thing you want to think about when you're considering cleaning a quilt is the fiber content. So a lot of quilts, many, many quilts, especially historic quilts, are made of cotton, some linen, um, and that reacts and responds very, diff very differently to cleaning than something like wool or silk. Um, cotton will shrink, wool will also shrink, um, wool will particularly shrink uh, with the addition of heat um, and agitation and silk can be incredibly fragile. So an awareness of what kind of fiber you're working with is a really good first place to start. You also wanna take a look at the construction of the quilt. So you wanna really examine the seams and just see if there are any places where you might have pop seams or stitching coming loose at the seams because any kind of cleaning can really exacerbate that. Similarly, seam allowances. You wanna take a very close look at those. Sometimes if um, pieces weren't cut necessarily perfectly straight, those seam allowances may be a lot smaller than a quarter inch. In fact, if the fabric were to shrink or pull just a little bit, it might open that seam right up. So you really wanna keep an eye out for that. And then you also just wanna have an awareness in terms of condition as well as fiber content of not just the top of your quilt, but also the backing and the batting or foundation, if it's a foundation piece to quilt, just to be overall aware of the condition of those, the fiber content of those as you're going into your cleaning considerations. The next thing you need to keep an eye on is the dyes that were used in the quilt. Um, dyes can be color fast or color fugitive, which oh, most of us are familiar with color fastness. Basically that dye stays where it's 
supposed to be even if the quilt gets wet or has um, some kind of detergent applied to it. Um, color fugitive then is the opposite. So that color will wash out, that color will bleed. Um, it may cause problems, much larger problems than whatever soil is already on the quilt. So um, if you were to do some kind of wet cleaning, you would want to do a color fastness test um, before you really submerge that quilt and just test a small area and see what happens with those dyes. Do they bleed? Do they fade? Is it worth continuing with that wet cleaning? So now I'll go over a few methods. So the very safest method is vacuuming, as I mentioned. Um, so if you want to vacuum at home with your home vacuum, you can. Um, you just want to put it on the lowest setting and then um, wrap pantyhose or tights around the end of the hose so that you are creating a filter so you don't pull up fibers. Or you can do what we do, go to the hardware store and get a screen, plastic screen. And then we finish the edges of ours with bias tape so that the edges are not scratchy. Um, airing is another method, not quite as safe, a little more risky, but still much more safe than some of the other methods I'll discuss. So with that, you would want to, um, on a dry, relatively breezy day, if you have a space that is um, shaded entirely because you don't want to expose the quilt to a bunch of sunlight um, and you have clean cotton bed sheets you can lay out on the ground that will be larger than the area of your quilt, you can lay your quilt out and just let it air out and that will get rid of a lot of those odors that you might um, that might be bothersome and you may find that you don't actually need to do anything further. Um, a, quite a bit less safe, but still in the realm of um, something we might occasionally recommend. If a piece is truly just very, very soiled and it's basically unusable or not worth keeping unless some of that soil gets out, you can consider trying a wet cleaning. So with a wet cleaning, um, you want to take either like your bathtub or um, a plastic wading pool and fill it with a few inches of distilled water and then just gently lay the quilt or quilt top down in the water and just let it sit. You don't want to agitate it, you don't add any kind of detergent and you just use room temperature water um, and just let it sit for several hours. And sometimes you may find that you need to empty out the water and refill it couple of times. And once that water is relatively clear, then that means you've gotten about everything out of it that you're going to. Um, the danger with wet cleaning can just be, in addition to um, those issues with color fastness of the dyes, um, that it's pretty difficult to get the quilt then out safely when it's soaking wet and those fibers are um, full of water, very heavy, and it's easy to damage them base because they are so much heavier than they were when it was dry. So you just wanna be really careful keeping it as flat and supported as possible when you're getting it out. And then similarly to airing, you wanna just lay it out somewhere flat on top of clean towels and sheets to dry and either do that outside in a shaded area or else if you can do it somewhere like um, a room in your home with that you're able to run fans and dehumidifiers, that could work pretty well too. So the least safe methods are dry cleaning, spot cleaning, and the washing machine. So dry cleaning introduces a lot of chemicals into your quilt that then um, you can't get back out. And so it may not come back from the dry cleaners looking like there are any issues, but because those chemicals have been introduced and because they are now reacting with the existing chemicals in the quilt, in the fibers and in the dyes, um, you may have shortened the life of your quilt in many, many years without even knowing it. Um, spot cleaning has a similar danger with, um, as we talked about with those issues with dye fastness. So you just want to be very careful that you're not, um, A, introducing bleach or something like that into your quilt and causing chemical reactions that you don't want to have happening and B, just that you're not going to create a faded or bleeding area with your spot cleaning. And then finally, the washing machine is the very most hard on quilts. So you really, really want to avoid that. Um, it can be 
difficult to bring home a quilt that looks really beautiful but has some stains on it and not want to throw it in the washing machine but we really 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 would caution against that the agitation and um the often hot water all of those things are really hard on the quilt and can really really destroy a quilt in short order so especially if you are hoping to preserve your quilts for a long time a washing machine is a really bad choice for cleaning so the next thing we're going to talk about is light so light damage is cumulative and irreversible and we've borrowed this image from our friends at history nebraska because i thought it illustrated really well what we're talking about here this also happens to quilts so this is a Ulysses S. Grant doll, and you can see on the part of his uniform that's flipped back, the original color of the uniform, but all the areas that were exposed to sunlight over the last many years, that blue has completely faded out. The same thing will happen to quilts. Um, so you wanna be really careful with that. And a lot of the time quilts, quilts that you will purchase at an estate sale or an antique dealer, or something like that will already have seen a whole lot of sunlight just from use. So you want to be extra careful to mitigate as much as you can in the remaining years. Um, now a little bit about temperature and humidity. So stability of environment for your quilts is really important. You want to keep them between ideally between 62 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit, 17 and 22 degrees Celsius, 45 to 55 percent relative humidity, which for the most part is about the temperatures that are comfortable for people too. So the good news is keep your quilts in the area of your home where you live and they'll be pretty safe. You really want to avoid attics and basements just because of those fluctuations in temperature and humidity. Um, when it's very dry and hot, it can dry out the fibers in the quilts. Um, when it's cool and damp um, or warm and damp it can lead to a lot of mildew and um, you can get your quilts can get moldy which is a huge problem and really really difficult to mitigate so you really want to keep that from happening if you can so the next thing i'd like to talk about is pest management and this isn't a problem it's rarely a problem but when it is a problem it's a really big problem so it's just a really good thing to be aware of so the beginning steps you can take are just make sure your quilts are pest free when they're entering storage. So you can do um, a visual inspection and if you see pests on a quilt and you haven't purchased it yet, um, maybe go ahead and pass on it. Um, but if you have inherited quilts or you, you just find that you have a quilt that has um, some kind of pest on it, you want to immediately seal it up in a large airtight bag um, for at least two weeks. And really anytime you bring a new piece into your home, that's a good idea, new quilt or other textile. Sealing it up for two weeks, that's exactly what we do at the museum, just to make sure that all cycle, all uh, stages of that insect life cycle are covered by those two weeks. So even if there are eggs in that quilt, the two week time frame will make sure that they are suffocated by the time that two weeks is up. Keep your storage spaces clean. Even if you don't go in them often, it's a good idea to just sweep and keep an eye out. Just make sure nothing is taking hold in there. Again, you wanna maintain that temperature and humidity, not just for the health of your quilt in that sense, but also because um, certain temperature and humidity levels invite more bugs. The warmer and damper it is, the more bugs like to come in. And finally, just performing visual checks when you're refolding your quilts every couple of years. So you just want to know what you're looking for. There are three main insects that we keep an eye out for at the museum, and I will discuss those next. So the first is clothes moss. So you can see the life cycle here. And they do have a surprisingly long larval stage. All of these insects do. So um, we tend to think of bugs as having very short lives. But as you can see here, the larval stage of a clothes moth can last almost three years. Um, so that's something you just really want to be on the lookout for. Um, and so clothes moths 
as their name implies, will eat textiles. Um, they use textiles to create that cocoon that you see in the cocoon stage, so they can do a lot of damage. Wool moths, similarly, just like their name sounds, they are attracted to wool, they eat wool. Um, in the first photo, you can see a wool moth larva next to a pen for scale. So uh, they are very tiny, so you do really need to keep an eye out. And on the other side, you can see the adult moth, what that looks like. So quite a bit different than the brown kind of house moths that we see around in the summer and fall. Um, pretty distinctive markings to keep an eye out for. And finally, carpet beetles um, will also eat textiles. Um, they have a very distinctive look as larvae. They're striped and they are furry. Um, the problem is that they're very tiny, so you have to look quite closely to find them. Um, and the adults are quite a bit larger and have this distinctive striated pattern on their backs. So next I'd like to talk about storage. So once you've vacuumed your quilt or however you've chosen to clean it, um, then how should you store it? So there are safer methods versus definitely unsafe, much like with cleaning. So if possible, you really want to store your quilts flat. Um, ideally, if you have a back bedroom, an unused bedroom that you can keep quite dark and have the quilts flat on a bed, that's the very best thing. But that is obviously not possible for a lot of people because of space constraints. Um, it's not possible for us at the museum to store everything flat. So we use acid-free archival cardboard boxes and um, you can purchase those from us. You can purchase them from online museum retailers. I believe you can um, get them at the container store also now. And so if you are folding your quilt, you want to use acid-free tissue or unbleached muslin on the face of the quilt before you fold it up. And that just keeps those fibers from abrading one another when the quilt is folded. You wanna refold periodically. We refold all of our quilts on a rolling two-year schedule. And um, not only does that just help us keep an eye on how they're doing every couple of years, but it also helps us to avoid those hard fold lines as much as we possibly can. Um, and if you don't wanna do a cardboard box, if you feel like that um, isn't a good fit for you, you can also do um, new high density polyethylene. You wanna look for the two symbol on the bottom of it or polypropylene. You want to look for the five symbol and if you use those you just want to make sure that you are using a muslin or cotton barrier in between the quilt and the plastic. Um, so you really don't want to use cedar chests or cardboard boxes without a significant barrier, again muslin or cotton, because um, of oils that will leach right into your quilt. You really don't wanna hang your quilts or put your quilts in a bedroom full of light because that will fade them intensely. Um, and then finally, you really want to avoid those plastic totes or plastic bins other than the high density polyethylene or polypropylene that we talked about because those will also leach out and off gas into your quilts, which is really hard on them. So that is all I have today. Hopefully that was a good overview for you of caring for your quilts at home. Thank you. And again, happy National Quilting Day.